And thank you to uh, everyone who's been speaking so far this morning. I definitely want to echo your comments on how getting people who are operating in completely different branches of an organization with different technical uh, acumens, it's really important to level that playing field. And that's something that we've tried to do quite extensively at Desktop Genetics. Um, so the idea that we work on is how can we optimize the design of CRISPR molecules to edit genomes? Um, and we're interested in doing this uh, because most CRISPR molecules, um, or CRISPR in general, doesn't have a very well-defined rule set in general. It's difficult to predict how well a CRISPR molecule will work in a cell and then realize an actual edit. Um, and there's a lot of complexities going on at the DNA level, RNA level, protein level. Uh, and it's a really, really interesting problem space that can be solved with machine learning. And if we can make the design and use of CRISPR more effective, we can then uh, effectively unblock researchers from using this um, for functional genomics and drug discovery. And if we can build more effective CRISPR libraries for early stage research, untangle how the, uh, the rules really work, then we can also learn how to apply CRISPR in the therapeutic context as well, where you can't really afford to have it go wrong because this might kill the patient. So really today we're focused very much on building great research tools from our algorithms, but we do have some research programs on therapeutic genome editing as well. And I have to use this one. Uh, so today what I want to talk about is uh, basically just to provide a brief intro to CRISPR. Uh, I apologize to all of those who know it inside out, uh, but I know that many of you guys are going to be clinicians or otherwise computer scientists. Uh, and then I'll talk about how we apply machine learning to CRISPR, um, the CRISPR design process and the data that we've generated, and also the path forward. So as I mentioned, we've got a very interdisciplinary team of uh, genomic scientists, molecular biologists, uh, data scientists, bioinformaticians, uh, user interface designers. Uh, so it's, it's a great blend of both tech and biotech, and I'm very pleased to work with everyone. In particular, I want to recognize the work of these two fine gentlemen here, uh, Riley Doyle and Mark Dunn, our CEO and data scientist, respectively, who've really been leading a lot of this technical work. Um, if you want the slides, uh, then just send an empty email to aibio.com, and you will have those in your inbox almost immediately. Uh, so, a brief intro to CRISPR. Effectively, uh, you're looking at a two-component system which is used to chop up and repair DNA. And you have uh, the first component, the Cas9 nuclease. This is the enzyme that cuts the DNA, uh, but alone it cannot really find where to cut. And so the second component is this RNA, or guide RNA, uh, otherwise known as a guide. Now, these two things complex together to form an active uh, CRISPR molecule. And how it's able to find its target is based on base pair sequence, uh, base pair matching uh, of this variable region, which is really where this design comes in. You have to be able to design that guide to target um, uh, what you want to edit. And of course, there's a problem in that it's only 20 base pairs along. It can bind to other places in the genome. And it also tolerates mismatches. So sometimes it can bind and cut at locations that you didn't intend for it to cut at. Uh, so that's the active RNA-guided uh, Cas9 complex. So if you are CS-oriented, uh, I like to think about uh, the central dogma of biology in terms of a tech approach, where basically you've got your cell operating as your computer. Uh, the DNA is all of your source files. Um, the uh, RNA is effectively these uh, binaries that are actually getting uh, executed. And then the proteins are the actual objects that you're loading into volatile memory. Um, and then CRISPR is basically like a stream editor. It lets you uh, effectively throw some packets of information uh, into an editing stream and modify it on the fly. So uh, let's see if I can get this to play. Where's the mouse? OK, perfect. So here it is in action. Uh, you have the CRISPR molecule with the guide right here. So this has been chemically synthesized. There's various ways to deliver this into the cell. Um, it does eventually make its way into the nucleus. And then at this point, there's a number of molecular events going on where the Cas9 seeks to first unwind the genome. And it's looking for a PAM site, basically the presence of an NGG. If that NGG is present, it unwinds it. Then you have the RNA uh, pairing with the DNA. And if you get a precise match, two uh, different domains activate, each one cutting a separate DNA strand. Then at this point, the cell uh, recognizes that the DNA is damaged, and it seeks to repair that damage. 
Uh, it either does non-homologous end joining, where that repair is effectively random, and this results in functional knockout, or alternatively, the investigator can introduce a new piece of DNA known as a donor, uh, which has homology arms similar to the cut sites, and then this allows you to uh, effectively knock in uh, a piece of DNA that you're interested in studying. So that might be uh, mutations that you found uh, in a patient population. And perfect. Great. So why are we interested in this at the very high human level and at the medical level? Uh, well, really, it's about cell and gene therapy. This is the ultimate application of CRISPR. You have a patient, you extract some cells, you characterize them at the DNA level, and then you have to go and design one of these custom CRISPR genome editing vectors. You introduce that into the cells, you modify them in the ways that I've just shown you, and then uh, you put those back into the patient. What you're trying to do really is screen out any cells that have been edited inappropriately, which might lead to uh, runaway mutations or uh, cancer. Um, and you only want to reintroduce those cells to the patients, the ones that, uh, where your CRISPR protocol worked and you got the desired effect. Um, so there is a fair amount of hype about CRISPR when it comes to genome editing and the future. Um, a lot of it is centered around cell and gene therapy, which I think is realistic. Some is centered around designer babies and things. I think that's quite unrealistic, at least in the short term. But the main application right now is really these research tools. Now, this gets a little bit more complicated. The design of the CRISPR uh, is quirky. And it's not just about the way that the CRISPR system will interact with DNA in general, but how it will interact with your DNA. And we've each got four to five um, million SNPs compared with the person sitting next to us in this audience, or just in any audience. And um, this can profoundly influence how CRISPR uh, cuts. So here is my genome up on top, and then that's one of my co-founders' genomes below. Um, this was based on 23andMe data. Um, and what you see, each of those lollipops up there is a valid guide site, which is present because there's a PAM site, that NGG. And you see that two guides go completely missing from my genome versus my colleague's genome uh, because there is a SNP. And further, you see a change in the scores on some of those uh, more three prime uh, guides. And that's, again, just because of this single SNP. So the guides that we might choose to edit one patient or to edit one cell might be very different from the guides that we choose to edit another one. And so you really ought to be factoring in the uh, cellular or genomic context of the model that you're working in or the patient. And that's something that we found is actually uh, quite overlooked uh, in general. Further, this gets a little bit more complicated. It's not just about uh, looking at the DNA sequence, although that's what most of our work has currently been based on. Um, you know, CRISPR systems are ribonuclear proteins. So you're looking at protein and protein interactions, DNA-RNA interactions, RNA-RNA. So it gets very complex very fast. And five years in, what we're now starting to see is that it's, uh, the binding and the cutting events are actually completely separated. Uh, so we're really, as a field, only just starting to sink our teeth into knowing how the system works to generate enough data that we can start training our models on. So the process itself, uh, briefly, characterize the cells at the beginning, ideally pull that sequence in, run your design package, have a final list of guides that you want to use to interrogate your targets, manufacture those, and that can be um, through a number of options, which I'll show you shortly, run your screen, sequence the results at various time points, and then analyze the subsequent data. So uh, what we provide at Desktop Genetics is the design and manufacture together. And we've really got uh, six different uh, pipelines that we run where investigators say, these are the targets I am interested in either knocking out or uh, activating or interfering uh, with their expression with. Uh, we take that list. We also say, you know, what is the delivery vector that you want to use? and we modify the final guides that we would produce, the final library that we would ship to them based on the research that they're doing. And so uh, these would be some arrayed libraries uh, that would show up depending on what you've ordered. And in addition to this, we're also modifying our designs depending on how the researcher wants to use it, whether they're going for, say, uh, pooled DNA oligos or uh, plasmids or lentivirus, or either doing uh, arrays on lentivirus, plasmids, and uh, synthetic ribonuclear proteins. OK, so applying machine learning to CRISPR. What have we found? So there's two computational problems here. 
The first is activity, and that's how do we design a CRISPR that we know will cut effectively on target? And then the second is specificity. It's making sure that it's not cutting anywhere else and predicting that. And each of these are basically prediction ranking exercises that we're looking at. And given the guide or all the guides in a particular gene, what do we think is going to be the best set of guides to get the results that we're after? Um, there's some other ways that you can look about this at higher or lower levels. So you could look at maybe lower biochemical outcomes or higher level patient outcomes. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's always some kind of uh, prediction problem based on a very, very large number of variables. Um, hence why we're applying machine learning to this. So we found some interesting things when we look at uh, the behaviors of our uh, users of our software. So in addition to producing libraries, we've got some free to use software tools, which are basically entry level CRISPR tools. And we've observed scientists using them. And what we see is that expert scientists uh, get kind of tired. They're, they're not great at designing CRISPRs every time. Uh, they inconsistently apply whatever the latest rules are. Um, they will give more weight to the larger body of evidence than they uh, might have seen so far. Like a new paper will come out, they'll get excited, and then suddenly the trend is to design your CRISPR molecules this way. Uh, they don't consider it anything more than the reference genome, so almost everyone is using a standard reference genome, which for early stage research is okay. Uh, but if you're taking something through to, say, the translational stage, you should be considering it. Um, and they're really concerned with picking the combination, or the smallest combination of winning guides to get the effect that they want, rather than designing their uh, population of guides in a manner which is going to yield uh, unbiased results uh, that lets them learn something that is uh, very meaningful uh, about the system that they're studying. So machine learning uh, really excels at uh, selecting the population of guides uh, that's sufficiently diverse, uh, chosen randomly within certain parameters that we set, and also follows good experimental design principles. So these are some of the uh, interesting things that uh, we've been looking at in terms of positive and negative predictors that we found. Um, it's basically a laundry list that we, we assembled by first studying all of the literature and looking at how the different uh, academic design tools have been designed. Each academic lab tends to prioritize one particular uh, set of rules. Um, what we've sought to do is to combine them and then also say whether or not some rules are more or less valid than others. Um, we also look up the words that make up that sequence, right? So we're looking at the occurrences of A's, C's, T's, and G's within the guide. Um, the uh, formation of pairs or triplets um, or uh, quintuplets and so on. And we're basically using a fairly common approach that you would see in, say, natural language uh, processing applications, because it's all words, it's all strings. Um, and there's a lot of algorithmic similarities between what they're doing and what we're doing. Um, we ended up with about um, sorry, my apologies. We ended up with about 4,700 uh, different features in total, uh, which was enormous. And so we tried to pair that back for our initial set of studies, uh, really to determine what is leading to uh, an ideal activity uh, score and an ideal specificity score as well. Um, so we are also taking into account the mutations in the cell line, as I've mentioned. Um, so we're factoring in those four to five million SNPs as best we can when the client demands it. And oftentimes, uh, they don't. And that has a particular influence on the final set of guides that we would use. Uh, so in terms of the experiment, uh, we are generating all of the data uh, based entirely on next generation sequencing. We're doing that at particular <coughs> time points throughout the experiment, particularly at the screening stage. But then we're also running uh, sequencing to make sure that everything that we're putting into the cells is verified as well. So it's, it's basically confirming that what we are physically producing is matching our virtual models at every time. And that can get really expensive when you're running that amount of sequencing in addition to everything going on in the screen as well. And that's also why we are effectively a technology company. We do not have a laboratory, and we are producing these things, and then we work with our partners and our customers to really feed that data back into the model. Uh, so. In terms of our infrastructure, uh, we work on Google Cloud Platform, uh, which has been really handy as um, you know, we use that to, to store the terabytes and terabytes of data. It uh, stops the bioinformaticians from having to do a lot of expensive hard drive maintenance and security, so they're very happy about that. 
Uh, the tech R&D team on the left is really doing most of the heavy lifting. So these are the guys that are prototyping their code around the clock. You know, they're reading the new papers as they come out, they see something that they like, they experiment, they test, and then once something is locked, they shift that over into the product team, uh, and that's all done via API. So uh, basically, the tech R&D team commits their code, makes that available to the product team, and then the product team is building a beautiful front end, which is then uh, uh, pulling that data in from the back end that they've created. Um, so at the host level architecture, uh, we have uh, particular worker instances, uh, which are basically just collections of uh, popular Python packages, which you may have used. Uh, we use some Cython. Uh, the backbone is Tornado for the event loop. Uh, we've also used um, quite a few C extensions as well. And um, the other really interesting thing that we found is that when you're running a machine learning pipeline, there's really two systems that have to operate in parallel. The first system is the one here shown in blue. And that's basically your in silico model of the cell. And it's a very, very data intensive system. Um, the second one is our machine learning pipeline, which is shown here in orange. And this is a much more linear computational model. Um, but basically, you see that you've got two orthogonal like uh, data science and data engineering problems that need to be worked out running in parallel. And there's just a lot of work that needs to happen in order to deal with one of these like fundamentally new problems that is crossing two different spaces of just uh, standard machine learning, uh, and then you know making it relevant in terms of the uh, biological context. So how do we actually measure guide performance? Uh, so uh, we use a depletion assay. Um, effectively, what you're doing is you're taking all of these cells. You are um, infecting them with CRISPR cassettes, and each CRISPR cassette has a particular guide on it, which has a particular target. And there's a number of genes which are going to be essential, and what you're doing is you're sequencing at various time points. At the beginning, you see these are my cells with the CRISPR cassettes knocked in at point zero, and then over time, we're seeing which of the cell populations are being depleted via NGS, and then we can see if uh, one population of cells is eradicated within a few days, we know that that guide that was knocked in initially or transfected in is very, very effective. And so uh, you can then work backwards and say which guides uh, work and which ones work less well. Um, so things get a little bit complicated in terms of the noise that can be produced. And there's a number of factors that contribute to this. Um, so here, um, we're showing that different groups are actually taking their time points, so they're sequencing their screens at different points in their experimental cycle. And so you have to normalize that. Um, in addition, uh, you have some problems with uh, inactive guides, or, or rather, uh, how to put this? Uh, Non-specific guides. They are... Uh, they present some issues. The reason being, uh, this guide is not very good at doing its job. And so it's not cutting at the essential gene that you might have expected it to, but it's cutting in other genes as well. And that may or may not be genotoxic. Um, so you get a lot of um, uh, requirements to do this additional signal processing and data cleanup before you feed your data into your machine learning pipeline. OK. Uh, so um, another interesting thing that we found about essentiality, and I'll uh, speak a little bit more about this, is that we don't actually really know about all the genes that are essential for cell survival in every single circumstance. Uh, and so we've had to find a way to really obtain a subset of genes that are um, believed to be as essential as, as uh, we could say. And so what we did is we looked at a couple of different CRISPR libraries uh, that have been validated, and we looked at genes uh, sorry, we looked at guides that were able to successfully knock out essential genes in both of those libraries, and those were effectively some positive controls. Um, and then the hope is that we can determine rules about each of those guides and then generalize them to other experiments. So how did we do? Okay, so um, up here on the left is you have our model, uh, which is Dunn 2017, named after Mark Dunn. And then over here on the right is uh, the gold standard in the industry at the moment, uh, which is the Dench 2016 score. Both of these are activity scores. Um, and what we show is that um, 
we're basically trying to predict the rank of guides based on the likelihood of their ability to elicit the result that we're after, in this case, knockout. And this was all done with SPCAS9. Um, we did this by using uh, the Spearman correlation coefficient uh, of the metric, and then uh, we plotted the predicted performance versus the actual performance. And what you're seeing here is basically like a, a marathon prediction, where we look at all of the best runners or all of the guides, and we say, how well can we predict their performance in the next marathon based on their performance in the last marathons? And what you see is you don't always get a 100% match. Uh, what we were able to get this to uh, in terms of our correlation coefficient was about 0.7. Uh, and if you match different experimental runs, you plot them against each other, uh, the close that we, uh, the, the, the correlation coefficient would be about 0.78. So we're really getting about as close to the limit from, uh, uh, we're getting as close to the limit of variability as we can that we would be able to just by looking at um, uh, you know, the variability between experiments. So this means that we're definitely better than the gold standard, but there's still a little bit of room to get better. Um, the other thing that we found that was surprising is that um, the generalized linear models actually perform surprisingly well. And the data science team looked at another, a number of different models that they could use. Um, so combination, com no, convolutional neural networks, um, uh, random forest graphs, and they found that this was just didn't add uh, an extra return as they might have expected. So simpler works very nicely, um, particularly if you're doing your upstream cleaning uh, appropriately. Okay, uh, so we've also done this in uh, mice. And what we found uh, was similar findings. Uh, we could get a, a good correlation coefficient. But the mouse prediction did not improve as much as with the human which we thought was quite interesting. We were asking ourselves, why is this the case that we can make it better for human, but not for mouse? And so um, the, the short answer to this really is um, that, uh, maybe over here, it depends on the data that you're using initially. So the performance of the model increases uh, roughly linearly with the amount of data that you're putting in to the system, uh, which is pretty consistent with all of the other machine learning work uh, that's been done. But what's interesting is that this human data has a much steeper slope than the mouse data. And we believe this is because of the amount of money that's just been put into human, genome, uh, human genomics in general. Like the data sets are cleaner, they've been verified by a much, much larger community. And so you're starting off with uh, better data that informs uh, more productive results in the models that you're using. So that was very exciting, very interesting. If you're trying to develop models for new species, however, that's a big open question. It's like, okay, if we don't know what genes are essential, how do we first build that essentiality uh, uh, training uh, uh, library so that when we can start obtaining data from our depletion assays to then feed into our model and go through that iterative process? So uh, some conclusions and the path forward. Uh, we found that uh, denoising and normalization uh, are absolutely crucial to the performance of your final models. Uh, the linear model performed uh, surprisingly well. Um, models generalize very well um, within a species. So if you're looking at uh, editing different kinds of cell lines within a particular species, one model should be sufficient. Um, it may make sense for you to train a new model if you're using a different kind of nuclease on a very esoteric cell line which has, say, complexities in uh, chromatin and euchromatin structure. Um, but they don't actually generalize very well between species. So the model that you train in mouse um, is going to be quite different from the model that you train in human. And we're not really sure if this is something that's to do with the uh, available data in the first instance, or maybe it's just something to do with uh, some quirks of mammalian biology. Um, from a coding perspective in terms of the lessons learned, this one was really interesting. So you know, initially we'd looked at using some of these um, uh, microservices and containers like Docker, and we thought that this would increase the productivity of our data science teams by giving them great tools. Um, turns out that when you're working at like the coalface of machine learning, you're doing a lot of experimentation, right? You have to write a lot of product, uh, code that is just sitting mostly on your computer. It's not necessarily going into production environment. And if you're forcing all these like business constraints 
uh, effectively on your bioinformatics or data science team, they get annoyed, they're not uh, going to be as productive, and they may end up using, uh, not using those tools in the first place. So here we were kind of thinking, okay, we're gonna apply some lessons from our production team to our data science team, it didn't work out so well. Um, they're real big fans of Conda, and of course Google, Google Cloud Storage has been uh, absolutely essential uh, for working with this. So if you'd like to get involved with CRISPR, we have um, our data sets available on GitHub, uh, so you can try this yourself and see if you can do better than our models. Uh, we're currently hiring uh, for a couple interns uh, on the JavaScript uh, and uh, just a general uh, engineering internship as well. We will be hiring a head of manufacturing, uh, so that that's really about turning all of our designs into finalized libraries. And we've also got some more detailed blog posts on our blog that you can check out. Um, we've had a lot of recognition in the company recently. A ton of this has come in in 2017. Um, so we're all very excited about that. Uh, again, I want to thank Riley and Mark for their inputs on this presentation uh, and remind you that you can get all those slides and more uh, just by emailing that right now. So with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention and I'd like to open it to questions. I think that was a really nice uh, contrast to the previous talks that we've gone from patient records to uh, genome editing. Um, great. Are there any questions from the audience? I'm sure there are. Hi. Hi. That was an amazing talk. I Thank feel you. like many times these talks have so much like, stuff going on, and I think a lot of the insights you gave were very useful. Um, can you comment a little bit on, um, you know, as you're looking at, uh, so effectively what you're doing is if somebody wants to snip a DNA in a certain place, then you're providing them, you know, what the RNA probes ought to be that they're, they should be using, right? And you're learning this from data. And right now when you're conducting and, you know, you can infer based upon past data, but then you're building your library by doing real experiments. And so you're, com you're working with other providers or other labs to do these experiments. Do they then give the data back to you? <laughs> Good to question. Uh, so it really, was that it? Yeah, so the question is like, how do you do validation? Like what's your pipeline for validation? Is it based just on the literature? Is it based on these labs? Is it based on a variety of sources? And then if so, how do you homogenize all these various things into? Yeah, so there's really two parts of that, right? There's the, uh, initial ideation about what you are going to test in your designs, then there's the actual uh, uh, piping of the resulting data back into uh, your um, data science team. So in the past, we've worked with um, academic uh, labs uh, entirely through grant funding, so there's absolutely no problem in accessing the data there. Uh, we've also had some collaborations with companies, some of which have yielded very valuable data, uh, which we have put into our platform. Um, we've also had some collaborations which failed to find anything useful. So um, really it's about making sure that when you're a tech company and you don't have access to a lab, you need to make sure that every experiment that you do is answering you know, several different kinds of questions. And right now, we are developing a, a new validation library. You know, so the last time we validated these techniques in earnest was early 2016. And that was a combination of all of the academic literature reviews that we had done, some tests with academics that we'd fed back in, and then it was basically kind of like our, our third generation set of algorithms that we were then testing before making those available as products. Right now, what we're doing is we're expanding our product portfolio into different libraries. And so we're trying to create a single library of guides that is going to, one, revalidate everything we've tested in previously, um, look at all of the things that we've been interested in in the last couple of years, but then also we're trying to future-proof that for developments that we think may be happening based on conversations that we're having with academics and also things that are coming out of uh, some of the big CRISPR conferences that we're going to. Time for one more question. Over here. You need a mic. <clears throat> I guess there's the ongoing just IP battle going on in the background with CRISPR. I'm just wondering, you know, as in a commercial setting, are there any considerations you're putting in place, or is there anything you think about on that side of things? Any comments? You can yeah, make? absolutely. So, um, if if you do not have the intellectual property either as a provider of the technology or as a customer, then this will kill deals no matter what. Like depending on whether it doesn't matter if you're the customer or or the provider. 
that's just bad for productivity of your research teams. Um, so what we've done is we've partnered with uh, Horizon Discovery and Vectalis, and so we're able to offer some of our libraries with specific IP uh, protections, and that's coming in from uh, portfolios of different companies. Um, one of the things that we're actually doing right now is raising a 1.5 uh, million pound round, uh, which will be going live on Syndicate Room, I believe next week, specifically to invest in getting um, access to all of the IP, uh, so that we can un unblock even more deals, uh, but also investing quite heavily in our sales and marketing uh, and the development of new products. Thank you. That's Thank brilliant. you very Thank much. Thank you so much for your Thank talk. Thank you very it's much, really guys. Appreciate it. Thank you.